let me share the slide. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity to present on exercise and body composition, and I will be focusing more on interventional physiology. I'm I'm very much thankful to Professor uh, Vivek Kumar uh, Sarma sir, mm -hmm. Dr. Rajesh uh, sir, Dr. Pradeep uh, sir, and Dr. Vinay and all our other my colleagues here at AIMS uh, Rajkot. And I am Dr. Hanjabam Barun Sarma, sports and exercise medicine specialist, as well as medical and clinical physiologist. And I am currently the president of Indian Society of Sports and Exercise Medicine. So let's begin the talk. Precomposition is one of the important uh, and integral uh, part of the health related component of the physical fitness. And exercise, yeah, you already noted, is a structured uh, physical activity uh, with an aim uh, for improvement as well as maintenance of the different physical uh, fitness component. And hence, exercise has an important role for optimization of the body composition. Apart from the body composition, exercise and uh, physical activity intervention is also important for other components of physical uh, uh, fitness. Like here, you can see. Yes, uh, you can see here. Yes, you can see like uh, uh, cardiorespiratory endurance, uh, uh, muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, which are uh, other health related uh, physical fitness component, as well as the skill related physical component, which may be agility, coordination, balance, power, rate, and time and speed. Uh, so these are the different components of the physical uh, uh, fitness, and one has to uh, design a particular exercise as well as physical activity intervention targeting uh, each component of the physical uh, fitness. So going ahead with the uh, slide, we already know that the body composition has an important, uh, you know, uh, a predictor for uh, mortality, and this uh, and this is uh, more important than the information which is provided by BMI. Hmm. Like, for example, in this uh, graph, you can see that the hazard ratio for uh, total mortality increases as uh, the body uh, fat mass index increases, not BMI, but fat mass index increases, whereas, whereas the hazard ratio decreases with the increase in fat free mass. So that's why the important prognostic information, which is given by body composition, is more important than what a BMI can give. And, and and the, in, the preservation of the fat-free mass uh, or lean body mass is extremely important. If we talk about the two compartment model of the body composition, like fat mass and fat-free uh, mass, uh, uh, from pra practical point of view, this is important as compared to the other, like uh, what you call anatomical model, uh, where uh, the body composition can be can be divided into muscle, organ, bone, others, as well as the atibosized uh, tissue, or the chemical model, which may be uh, divided into fat, protein, carbohydrate, water, mineral, etc. So two compartment model uh, uh, is practically important, and and the preservation of the fat mass is uh, uh, maintenance preservation of the fat mass or lean body mass is one of the independent uh, marker uh, for increased risk for uh, what you call the mortality as well as morbidity. Yeah. So we can decrease that uh, risk of mortality as well as well as morbidity by increasing the uh, the lean uh, uh, body mass or fat free mass. Like for example, you can see that the relative muscle mass may be decreases. It may be decreased because of as related muscle loss, which may be uh, which is known as sarcopenia which is morally important after 40 to 50 years of age, or it may be incomplete because of the incomplete recovery uh, to any kind of the injury or anything, which happens in elderly population as compared to the uh, younger population who are uh, more able to uh, go into the complete uh, recovery of the lean muscle mass, or it may be because of the chronic muscle wasting condition, different chronic muscle wasting condition like rheumatoid arthritis, renal failure, type 2 diabetes, COPD, or cardiovascular disease, or it may be because of the rapid muscle wasting condition, uh, it may be because of the critical illness, sepsis, burns, or in case renal disease, these are all, uh, you know, related with a significant drop in uh, uh, relative uh, muscle mass. And you can see that the, by addition of the exercise uh, intervention, especially the resistant exercise, we can maintain or we can preserve 
uh, or we can decrease uh, the loss in uh, you know the muscle mass uh, the lean body ma muscle mass and regarding the sarcopenia or as related decrease in the you know lean, uh, lean body mass you can see that the grip strength here you can uh, see the muscle strength also decreases in both male and female uh, 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 with AS, especially after 40 years and significantly after 50 years, you can see that this is accompanied with the, what you call the de decrease in the muscle mass, the dynapenia, uh, that is the decrease in the strength uh, or power, muscular strength or power with AS or sarcopenia, uh, which is the decrease in uh, um, uh, muscle mass, uh, uh, generally begins uh, around 35 to 40 years of age and detectable at uh, what you call a 50 years or fifth uh, decade of the life and and the decrease the rate of the decrease may be uh, say 0.8 to 1 percent of muscle mass loss per year uh, or or say a uh, 0.5 to 1.2 uh, percent of muscle ma mass loss per year or the decrease in uh, strength or power may be two to three percent per year uh, which is uh, or approximately three percent per year uh, decrease is there. So decrease will be there. So our aim is we, we want to build up the, the muscle mass and strength uh, so that we have more reserve to loss as well as we want to uh, uh, decrease uh, the rate of the loss also by doing sufficient exercise intervention. And strength, uh, you know, is absolutely important. For example, here you can see in this paper that grip strength was found to be more important predictor of the cardiovascular mortality as compared to, uh, you know, blood pressure. And 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 the grip strength was also uh, you know associated with all cause mortality, myocardial infarction as well as the stroke. Uh, so this uh, this was the paper which was uh, uh, reported in 2019. That's why the maintenance of the body composition, especially muscle mass, with uh, adequate or appropriate exercise intervention is extremely important. Going ahead with the, uh, uh, the the importance of the body composition for health, you can see that adipocyte uh, two uh, is uh, not just inert mass of tissue. Eh? This is basically an endocrine gland, and now it is because of the unbalanced different adipocytokines. The adipocyte tissue can be considered as an organ of inflammation, causing uh, you know what you call a low grade uh, uh, chronic low grade systemic inflammation. Or it may be associated with the inflammation that is inflammation associated with the uh, aging or decline in age. And this inflammation, this chronic inflammation, uh, is basically the nemesis of the muscle mass. That is, the, the muscle uh, the, uh, the, it increases the loss of the muscle mass. So that's why our aim is for what you call uh, the uh, uh, the increase in lean body mass and decrease in adipocyte tissue, especially that kind of the adipocyte tissue, which is morely associated with the health abnormality, like for example, vascular, uh, you know, why, for example, VAT, that is visceral adipocyte tissue or central, uh, you know, what do central obesity, uh, which is morally prevalent in case of the males. And and in case of the uh, uh, the players also for the performance also we aim to uh, increase uh, the strength to weight ratio by doing different exercise intervention uh, which is uh, for uh, uh, improvement in uh, performance as well as for the improvement in health. So <clears throat> going again to the, uh, the the importance of the body composition of the some health. So this is what we have published in the paper. Like for example, we have uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, see the uh, uh, you know different uh, uh, indicator and propometric indicator for obesity uh, uh, as a good uh, predictor for increase uh, what you call a blood sugar level. And we have found that the waist height ratio, waist height ratio, which basically indicate the the central obesity, was found to be a significant uh, what you call uh, the classifier for increased uh, blood sugar uh, or equal to a more than 140 uh, milligram per deciliter and the cut cutoff was found to be uh, around 0. Uh, 0.596 in the same way waist circumference was also a significant uh, was was also found to be a significant classifier and the cutoff was uh, around uh, you know 93.5 centimeter uh, and, and again uh, th th this is basically we have done in healthy population or the, the population with uh, we, we have a, what you call uh, uh, not uh, any kind of the diagnose uh, uh, type 2 diabetes mm. uh, because we excluded the uh, you know the, the di diagnosed case of the type 2 diabetes this is just a survey data another one uh, uh, 
in this 2016 paper, uh, we basically uh, uh, see, uh, you know, compare the body composition parameter as well as BMI between uh, type 2 diabetic, uh, what you call male, uh, for uh, 40 type 2 diabetic male uh, with the as match, uh, what you call control. Yeah, you can see that the BMI and body fat uh, was not statistically significant, but but what you call VO2 mix or aerobic fitness was uh, significantly uh, less uh, among the type 2 diabetic. And which is which was also associated with uh, you know more uh, what you call the uh, uh, the abnormal bo bo body composition parameter like percentage body fat, uh, waist circumference, waist ratio was uh, among the type two diabetic. So type two diabetic was having less aerobic fitness or cardiorespiratory fitness or aerobic capacity associated with more uh, uh, more body fat especially what we call the central type of the body fat. Also, in this paper, what uh, we have uh, published in 2020, we have shown that the central obesity parameter, especially for uh, example, high high waist circumference as well as waist hip ratio was found to be a significant parameter for hypertension. So the, this is few of the paper we have done. And and since uh, we have we have already shown the importance of the what you call uh, the negative effect of the the type of the fat, especially the visceral adipocyte tissue, especially the what you call uh, the central type of the obesity. So we will uh, 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 we will discuss further in this line. So in this graph, you can see that this is a y-axis is diabetic prevalence and x-axis is, is is the obesity uh, prevalence. These are the different countries, and you can see that. There is a perfect correlation is there, perfect correlation with the increase in, uh, you know, obesity prevalence associated with the increase in diabetic prevalence in different countries. But, uh, you know, you, you have seen in some of the countries here uh, on on the what you call the extreme uh, uh, upward and the left side, like, for example, Pakistan is here, like, you know, South, uh, you know, South Asian countries, they are having more diabetic prevalence. But less obesity prevalence that means uh, you know they, uh, that they are having less uh, obesity mostly defined by the bmi but having more risk factor for diabetic this is basically the indian phenotype or south asian phenotype uh, which is mainly because of the something known as toffee that is in outside fat inside uh, because uh, from the outside uh, you know the fat subcutaneous fat is uh, you know very less as compared to the, uh, the fat which is deposited uh, in the viscera that is visceral adipocyte uh, adipose tissue is more as compared to the subcutaneous tissue this is basically the toffee in outside fat inside and this type of the uh, you know uh, uh, this type of the phenotype is associated with uh, if you measure if you depend upon the traditional measure of obesity uh, like a BMI hmm, instead of the body composition, then what will happen? So you will you will be having less uh, BMI, but you will be having high risk factor for cardiometabolic and different type of the uh, you know non communicable disease. Uh, Again, on the other side, there is, uh, uh, you know, something known as uh, what you call MHO, that is metabolically healthy obesity. In case of the metabolically healthy, healthy obesity or metabolically obese normal weight, that means they are metabolically obese, but they are having normal weight. If you see the BMI, if you see the BMI, the BMI will be in the normal range, but since they have more uh, type of the fat, which are more dangerous, uh, you know, uh, like uh, this one, metabolically unhealthy, uh, you know, the obvious, where, whereas the in case of the metabolically healthy obvious, the fat, which is mainly a subcutaneous fat, hmm, subcutaneous, instead of the uh, VAT, that is visceral adipocytes, so such person are, uh, are thought to be what you call uh, uh, less uh, risk, uh, less prone for different cardiometabolic, in spite of the having more subcutaneous fat, the more subcutaneous fat at the, what you call the hip and the thigh region, uh, has also been shown to be uh, somewhat protective as compared uh, to uh, you know the abdominal uh, subcutaneous fat uh, subcutaneous fat uh, uh, as far as cardiometabolic illness is concerned so this also uh, 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 lead to the, the concept of the obesity paradox where uh, you know uh, in some uh, disease like community acquired in pneumonia or some some other uh, condition the having uh, high bmi uh, 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 has been associated with uh, you know decreased mortality also but the problem is all this finding was based on bmi hmm. if you do uh, uh, the if you classify the, the the body fatness based upon the the, uh, the body composition marker like for example uh, 
the percentage body fat or fat mass, uh, you know, instead of BMI, then there will not be uh, the obesity paradox may disappear. So obesity paradox based upon BMI may be there, but obesity paradox based upon say waist circumference, say waist hip ratio, say uh, you know you know a fat a fat mass will will, will not be there. So this uh, that's why uh, uh, the estimation measurement you know uh, uh, of uh, uh, what you call the body fatness or lean body mass or percentage body fat uh, or different uh, the anthropometric uh, parameter uh, like waist circumference, waist hip ratio, weight high, waist height ratio is more uh, important as compared to uh, the PMI. Uh, and and this metabolically healthy obese has also been shown that uh, 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 in spite uh, they don't have any macroscopic level abnormality, but but this uh, MHO, it, uh, such such people such people has uh, you know has uh, uh, has uh, you know has uh, uh, abnormality. Uh, there's certain abnormality at the what you call the micro metabolic issue, or they may be associated with the micro metabolic abnormality, which may be what you call the the problem in the ethnoconnectin pathway, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, histological abnormality. Maybe there, you know, in case of the uh, 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 the, the visceral fat is here. So these are all important uh, uh, for uh, at the microscopic level. They are uh, they may act as an initiator for uh, this uh, risk because in the future. If you don't do any kind of uh, kind of effective exercise intervention, such person uh, who are MHO who has been levelled as a metabolically healthy but obese may not be healthy at all. They at the micro level, at the micro environment, at the micro metabolic level, they may be having abnormality, and this abnormality will basically lead rise to you know different cardiometabolic or non-communicable diseases. And for that exercise has been found to be an effective uh, you know intervention for the correction of such micro metabolic issue um, as well as a regulation of the metabolic homeostasis and enhancements of the metabolic flexibility for such uh, you know person so that's why even if you, uh, uh, even if a particular person is mh or that's metabolically healthy obese still exercise intervention has to be done and this exercise intervention is also important especially for the person with coffee because the visceral adipocytes tissue are known to respond more to what you call the aerobic exercise because of the uh, reportedly higher uh, you know uh, intervention of the what you call adrenergic uh, uh, intervention or sympathetic uh, in intervention because of that they may be found to be more responsive to aerobic exercise or high intensity interval training and all that stuff so Exercise intervention is important, both for both for uh, coffee. That is uh, what you call the person, like Indian phenotype person, who are uh, uh, more having visceral adipocytes tissue, but less subcutaneous tissue uh, fat, uh, subcutaneous fat. And also, their exercise intervention is also important for person uh, who are more metabolically, uh, what you call healthy, who has been, you know, defined as metabolically healthy. Obviously, there is M. So, so exercise intervention is very important. Going ahead with the, the body composition and the performance, some of the performance parameters, this is our experience. We have published different papers, especially in uh, among players, uh, among hockey players and different players. And we uh, we, we basically saw that instead of the uh, you know BMI, BMI is not useful at all, especially in case of the player. The player may be having higher BMI and that higher BMI may be because of the high uh, lean body mass uh, and low percentage body fat because BMI has component for uh, lean body mass and a fat mass. So such person, if you classify obesity just based upon BMI, they may be this super healthy person, maybe uh, you know uh, misclassified as obese if you uh, use only BMI. So BMI is not useful at all in in case of the player. And here, here in this paper, uh, you, uh, we, uh, we have shown that the gender difference between, uh, you know, VO to max, that is aerobic fitness, uh, was uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, was contributed more by BMI as, uh, as compared to body fat. How it is possible? That, why body fat is having less contribution than BMI? Because here in this paper, we uh, have not uh, uh, mentioned the lean body mass. So the BMI here. In, even though BMI has been traditionally used to classify fatness, but here BMI basically cons consists the uh, you know the component of the lean body mass also. So the, the BMI uh, was found to be more important, even important than percentage body fa uh, uh, fat as far as uh, you know VO to max difference, gender differences VO to max was concerned. Also here in this, uh, but. Uh, 
in uh, different paper uh, uh, the percentage uh, uh, the correlation the association of the aerobic fitness this is gender gender control uh, the aerobic fitness was more uh, with uh, what you call uh, the percentage body fat as compared to bmi hmm. the bmi the r square for bmi was uh, 45.7% only as compared to the 71.6% uh, uh, which was of the total variance in bo2 max which was explained by percentage body fat similarly uh, for non athlete person non players for a regular uh, you what you call uh, 20 to 40 healthy apparently healthy males person like uh, the functional uh, you know uh, functional uh, exercise or functional capacity uh, like six minute walk test. Uh, uh, here you can see that the six minute the distance walk in six minutes that is six minute walk test was um, explained uh, the total variance was more explained by uh, with uh, high hip ratio that is 77.4 percent and and, uh, and then by percentage body fat as compared to uh, bmi uh, the, the bmi uh, 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 the, the bmi basically uh, you explain 64% uh, so that means as compared to the bmi percentage uh, body fat and waist hip ratio was found to be more important predictor more more important influencer more important you know explaining uh, uh, the the variability in functional aerobic capacity uh, in the form of six minute walk test or in the form of the auto max in normal healthy individual as well as player. So this is one has to uh, one has to un understand. Again, uh, 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 going ahead with the uh, uh, the different uh, the, the other tree, uh, uh, the vertical jump itself, the vertical jump is basically uh, we already noted by vertical jump is basically the, the measure of the explosive power. Explosive power, or explosive muscle power, and this vertical jump uh, has been uh, reported to be an independent uh, marker, uh, a risk factor for, uh, you know, uh, for mortality as well as morbidity, and uh, and also they are found to be an important uh, marker for performance in player. And here you can see that the vertical jump, uh, you know, was uh, explained uh, significantly by SSF, that is skin fall, uh, uh, you know, some of the skin fall. By using Harpendil skin fold caliper, we have used uh, the skin fold uh, from tricep subscapular, you know, supraspinally abdominal front uh, of thigh and calf among ho hockey players and cyclists. And also the vertical jump in a separate paper we have found that was to be, you know, positively, uh, you know, correlated, positively associated with a lean body mass. Uh, uh, even though it is uh, relatively small, that is 22.9%, but it was statistically significant. So, so that means vertical jump was, uh, you know, negatively influenced by, the, uh, you know, the body fatness as indicated by the, some of the skin fall and positively associated with the lean body mass. Similarly, the lean body mass was associated, uh, you know, positive significant uh, with the ball hitting speed, that is uh, the speed of the ball, uh, you know, hit by uh, the hockey players, and which is and ball hitting speed is one of the important marker for performance. So from this paper, from our experience, uh, from different paper with which we have published, we have found that body composition, different uh, marker of the body composition was found to be more important than traditional uh, marker for fatness like BMI. So one has to uh, always take into consideration of the different uh, body composition parameter. Now again, going to uh, you know the the different uh, exercise intervention uh, uh, effect of them on uh, the aerobic fitness uh, on uh, body composition. Like for example, here is uh, what is the effect of the aerobic exercise on body composition. Traditionally, most of the time we always uh, you know the myth is there uh, regarding the fat max zone. Here. We already know that the fat oxidation or beta oxidation of fatty acid takes place in mitochondria, and fat oxidation can happen only in presence of oxygen. And oxygen and increase fat uh, utilization, fat as a fuel during the uh, fuel during the oxidation exercise happens. Uh, you know, in uh, what you call moderate exercise, you know, mild to moderate or little bit uh, lower part of the vigorous intensity exercise. And therefore, if you see the exercise, uh, the uh, this is the exercise intensity. Why exercise? Uh, X axis exercise intensity in the form of percentage bo 2 max, and this is the y axis in the form of the what you call a fat oxidation red. You can see that at a particular level, which is approximately around here, uh, here in this uh, around uh, say 62 or something, 
so this is the uh, this is this is the excise intensity where maximum fat burning happens. This is this is basically the dawn of the what you call MFO or maximum rate of the fat oxidation, and which is uh, traditionally uh, you know reported to be around uh, say 55 to 72 percent of the automax. Now this uh, uh, this can be converted into target rate by using the carbonyl formula here. Like for example, uh, between the resting heart rate uh, plus uh, 0.55 into heart rate reserve. And heart rate as a result is your maximum heart rate minus your resting heart rate. In the same way, uh, the upper limit of the uh, you know target heart rate will be you know your resting heart rate plus 0.72 uh, into your heart rate reserve. Uh, so th this is basically a fat max zone. A fat max zone. Also, uh, when we prescribe the exercise in case of the aerobic uh, you know uh, traditional uh, you know LSD, a long slow uh, distance running, or what you call the moderate uh, intensity continuous training. The traditional uh, aerobic exercise. We generally focus on the heart rate of say uh, uh, around 55 to 60 to 90 percent of the heart rate maximum, or say 40 to 50 to 85 percent of the VO2 max. Your heart rate maximum you can, uh, you, you know, uh, you can uh, estimate by using what you call the cycle ergometer testing, or it can be predicted by using what you equation like, uh, which was given by. Uh, at all 2001 that is at uh, 208 minus 0.7 into as in year or maybe simply to 20 minus s but the one which, which was given by Tanaka, that is 208 minus 0.7 into as in year uh, is more reliable uh, you know as compared to 20 minus s so based upon this uh, uh, the concept of the fat max zone the exercise uh, the you know the exercise has been the exercise heart rate or target heart rate has been designed in such a way that it falls during that in exercise intensity where fat uh, maximum uh, you know fat oxidation happen so based upon this fat fat oxidation um, uh, fat max zone mefeton uh, running is one of the you know type of the running which was uh, first described by mefeton or uh, what you call uh, the mf that is maximum aerobic function type of the running where the runner basically run at the heart rate of approximately around 180 minus as in year this is the their target heart rate it may be you know minus uh, 5 or 10 or plus 10 uh, depending upon a requirement or it may be for low ends or, or it may be uh, you know minus 10 for uh, you know uh, that uh, you, you may establish the range range around 180 minus as in here depending upon different uh, history or different fitness uh, parameter so basically what has happened is i plotted uh, you know the, the target heart rate of 180 minus as in here Based upon the percentage of the heart rate maximum calculated, predicted heart rate maximum is uh, opposed to uh, the different uh, different years in you know, different as in years, and th these are the two graphs. Uh, you know, one is the uh, 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 the traditionally the one is basically what you call uh, the one which is based upon two twenty minus as, and another one is basically what is the uh, uh, what you call. Uh, uh, the equation which was given by uh, Tanaka, that is 208 minus 0.7 into as in here. So you can see that approximately around this, for uh, for example, if you are around, uh, if you are, uh, if you are, uh, say, uh, what you call the, the 35 years of age, then uh, then your target heart rate for uh, or, um, Mephiton or MFA uh, running will be approximately around say 78.4 uh, percent of your maximum heart rate uh, or say 79 percent of maximum heart rate depending upon which formula we you use for calculation of the maximum heart rate so this is the 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 type of the running which is becoming very popular among you know different uh, damage or which have, uh, who, who have just started running and who are more uh, you know focus on slow running mm, slow running in order to improve their, their aerobic uh, function uh, as well as the increase uh, oxidation of the body uh, fat, of the body fat. But the one point one has to remember: everything is okay, but one should not forget that the uh, the exercise, hmm, the physical active, the thermic effect of the physical activity, approximately uh, you know corresponds to around fifteen to thirty percent of the total energy expend twenty four. That means. The, your your physical activity doesn't contribute most to the amount of the uh, energy expenditure uh, in in your 24 uh, hour and which is, and, and and instead the resting metabolic rate that is rmr is more important which uh, correspond to approximately around 60 percent to 75 percent of the you know your uh, rmr and regarding the meal 
thermic effect of the milk corresponds to around 10 percent and we already we all know that the protein has a high highest thermic uh, effect of the meal so so if you design a particular exercise which focus on the resting metabolic rate uh, not only on thermic uh, effect of the activity but more on the resting metabolic ra rate complement with the protein intake then uh, your uh, the the expenditure the, the your your calorie uh, you know expenditure during uh, or uh, the energy loss will be more as compared uh, uh, to the one which you focus only on thermal effect of activity so based upon this con concept in order to lose fat uh, you know, you only have to do exercise only in the target range of uh, fat max is uh, not uh, suitable because here you are targeting only this part that is thermic effect of the activity. But most important, uh, you know, the part of the, the whole other part of the day, uh, you know, the energy expenditure, uh, you know, it's more important if you want to lose the, if you want to do, lose the overall body fat, that means you have to focus on some activity which also influence the RMR. In our uh, pre previous paper, uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, let me, uh, we can uh, see that uh, uh, our VO2 max was, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you call directly uh, correlated with the uh, RMR, that is BMR, the cell metabolic rate. That means from this, we can see that the, those who are having more aerobic fitness tend to have higher uh, BMR. But, uh, you know, the results are conflicting. We don't know whether increasing aerobic fitness increase the BMR also or not. No, this uh, this uh, more studies require in, in this area because BMR or increased BMR is absolutely important if you want to uh, lose uh, fat, <clears throat> the overall fat. So, <clears throat> So that means, uh, you know, your traditional aerobic exercise, uh, you know, if you do in uh, your fat max zone, if you do slow running, like, uh, you know, uh, the, the MF running, etc., they all focus on the concept of the fat max zone. But we already know that not only, uh, you know, energy expenditure during the exercise, but after the exercise is more important. That's why you have to focus on other uh, this thing. And that may be the one of the reasons uh, that the exercise intervention uh, is not the best way uh, in order to lose fat or lose weight. Hmm. Dietary intervention is more important. So dietary intervention is more important if you are planning to lose only, uh, you know, fat and all that stuff. But if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to maintain the, the, uh, the weight which has been lost, then exercise is, uh, exercise is very important. Exercise has to be there. And exercise is extremely important, more important than dietary factor for uh, uh, what you call the preservation or maintenance or increase in uh, you know lean body, lean muscle mass so increase in lean muscle mass has to be there and and it has to be accompanied with dietary intervention so diet and exercise is extremely important so going ahead with the uh, uh, the, the importance of the aerobic exercise we already discussed that the aerobic exercise or exercise as uh, per se may not be having that much uh, higher effect on uh, you know reduction in weight body weight as compared to diet na, dietary intervention but exercise is more important uh, than diet mostly most of the paper has uh, uh, indicated such that it is uh, at least equal to diet or in fact more important than diet uh, if you are focusing more on reduction of visceral adipose tissue and we already know that vat of visceral adipose tissue is extremely important uh, because they are the one these are the type of the fat which are more associated with the insulin resistance or cardiometabolic abnormality here in this gra in this diagram you can see that this is the visceral adipose tissue uh, by using only diet intervention in case of the diabetic uh, diabetic females uh, which are giving intervention for 14 weeks you can see the difference between pre and post so dietary intervention although decreased the visceral adipose tissue but it was not statistically significant statistical significance happens only when if you add exercise to the dietary intervention here you can see that but but even if you don't do any kind of the dietary intervention, if you do only and only exercise, then exercise itself uh, can lead to a loss of the what you call visceral adipose tissue, hmm, significant, which, which was statistically significant. So if your aim is to lose visceral adipose tissue, which is more dangerous type of the fat, then exercise is absolutely important. Diet alone may not be sufficient. And here in this uh, graph also, you can see that this is for a normal individual, that is individual 425 individual without any metabolic uh, disorder. You can see that 
this is the change in the what you call the visceral fat per week uh, and the x axis is the, uh, the volume of the exercise aerobic exercise uh, in terms of met hour per week it's met hour per week so you can see that there is an inverse relationship is there and 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 for a significant lows uh, you know per week of uh, visceral fat then your exercise volume has to be at least 10 that means equal to a more than 10 met hour per week is uh, uh, essential for fat uh, reduction and if you see into uh, what you call moderate to vigorous uh, intensity exercise around 6 MET this uh, 10 MET hour per week translates to roughly around uh, say uh, what you call more than uh, 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 more than 300 uh, minutes per week traditionally WHO described uh, you know moderate to uh, vigorous intensity of exercise uh, you know, around uh, what you reported uh, intensity of exercise uh, around 150 minutes per week, uh, vigorous intensity exercise of around uh, 75 uh, uh, minutes per week. And if you want to increase more, you can increase, uh, uh, you know, moderate intensity uh, aerobic exercise from 150 minutes per week to 300 minutes per week. So, uh, but for, uh, uh, but if you take this uh, 10 MET, uh, you know, uh, 10 MET hour per week uh, uh, exercise volume, then you have to focus uh, more than uh, 300 uh, minute of moderate, uh, you know, uh, moderate aerobic exercise intensity, physical exercise intensity. It may be more than 300, maybe around 600 or so. And the aerobic exercise, the higher intensity of aerobic exercise was more effective as compared to lower intensity. Like, for example, if your intensity is based upon the more than, uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the uh, heart rate maximum was more effective as compared to exercise, which was done basically uh, at an intensity of less than 60 percent of the HR max. And this is more important, this high intensity aerobic exercise, relatively high intensity, relative to moderate intensity, this is basically the moderate intensity. The moderate intensity aerobic exercise is basically more important than, than low intensity as well as this aerobic exercise was more important as far as uh, reduction in visceral adipocyte tissue concern uh, from strength training in fact also so strength training uh, you know uh, uh, from different data up to now uh, which i have reviewed uh, i came to uh, this uh, this thing that aerobic exercise especially uh, you know it may be high intensity or moderate intensity uh, you know traditional classic uh, what you call the longer uh, uh, steady state exercise or high intensity interval training uh, may be more uh, uh, important uh, than uh, uh, strength training or equal to the effect of the strength training but if you combine aerobic exercise and strength that is good but aerobic exercise uh, was found to be more beneficial for in some paper some paper but the ideal is you always combine aerobic exercise with the with the uh, you know the component of the high intensity as well as component of the uh, strength training so this uh, concept one has to understand before designing an exercise interval similarly let's go ahead with the high, high intensity interval training and this high intense intensity interval training is absolutely important in today's world where everyone seems to be busy because see high intensity interval training uh, you know give you all the similar identical beneficial effect beneficial uh, you know effect uh, of a traditional uh, long distance running lsd slow uh, you know long distance or long slow distance or moderate intensity continuous uh, in the continuous exercise traditional aerobic exercise but at a very much less time that is it may be less than 55 50 percent of the, the time which may be required for achieving those that that benefit in uh, if you do traditional aerobic exercise that's why high intensity uh, interval training is very much important high intensity interval is basically for, uh, for you know uh, intensity has to be general high it may be vigorous to near maximum intensity it may be done for say less than 45 seconds to four minutes uh, and it may be accompanied with rest uh, you know duration or or light to moderate intensity exercise, which may be of this equal duration of the high intensity, high intensity part, or it may be one to six minutes or so, depending upon your requirement. And here in this paper, you can see that high intensity interval training was more effective as compared to control as well as for steady state exercise, which is the traditional aerobic exercise, as far as what, as far as what subcutaneous fat loss was concerned. Oh, and also for abdominal fat loss, huh? abdominal fat, fat loss, you can see that still statistical significant, uh, you know, effect was seen for uh, if you use the high intensity interval training as compared to, uh, you know, steady state exercise or control, this is important. 
Similarly, in various meta-analysis also, the, the similar report has been uh, uh, found. And here you can see that the high-intensity interval training has not only effect on the fat mass, huh? it has not only effect on the fat, but was also more effective for increasing or preservation of the lean muscle mass. That means high intensity of, uh, uh, interval training has an important component, not only for fat loss, but also for preservation or maintenance or increase of the lean muscle mass or lean body mass also. And, and here you, you, you can see that uh, this high interval interval uh, high intensity interval training or MICT that is moderate intensity continuous training, which is a traditional exercise, they may be identical for fat loss and uh, what you call fat free mass gain. But but the point is but the point is this ICI ITR accompanied in less than half the time of MICT. That is very important. But one has to understand as I've already uh, I focused that the absolute amount of the fat loss from aerobic exercise is relatively less. And therefore, you have to add, uh, you know, strength training. You have to add dietary intervention. Without any dietary intervention, if if you only and only uh, aim is to lose uh, body weight, then you may not success. That's why dietary intervention is very much important in compared to the exercise intervention. So these are the various high high intensity uh, exercise. And again, high intensity exercise seems to be more, uh, uh, you know, uh, beneficial, uh, you know. Uh, as far as uh, what you call uh, 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 the visceral adipocyte reduction is concerned, like uh, here you, you can see that this is a rest and exercise, this is aerobic exercise, this is a combination of aerobic uh, uh, rest and training, this is the sprint interval training, this is the high intensity interval training. Here you can see that the high interval, uh, uh, interval uh, training, uh, which uh, you know it does not the 95 uh, percent confident interval does not does not cross the zero line. That means it is more effective. And for aerobic exercise also, it does not cross cross the zero this 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 zero line. That means the aerobic exercise and HIIT are more effective if your aim if your aim is for reduction of the VAT, that is visceral adipocyte tissue which may be uh, but if you come even if you come combine aerobic exercise with rest and training still aerobic exercise alone or hiit was found to be more effective for reduction of the uh, visceral adipocyte tissue uh, visceral reduction because it is more important than rest and training here you you, you can see the rest and training here and the confident interval basically crossed the zero line Similarly, for aerobic exercise in combination of the rest and training, same here, it cross SIT also here, but only high intensity interval training as well as aerobic exercise uh, was found to be more effective for visceral adipocyte reduction. And regarding the, the intensity, you can see that light intensity has no, uh, no beneficial effect was, was seen. If your intensity has to be at least moderate, uh, moderate or vigorous intensity, they are relatively same. The, so therefore, in order to, because vigorous intensity exercise may be associated with some health abnormality and some risky individual, at least, uh, you know, moderate intensity of exercise, moderate uh, in intensity exercise you can do, uh, like high intensity interval training or a traditional aerobic exercise can be done uh, in order to achieve uh, your goal of the visceral adipocyte tissue reduction, uh, visceral fat reduction. And, and 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 the goal, uh, you know, the dose uh, which uh, uh, the author has uh, given is basically uh, for say three times a week for three to four months of thirty to sixty minute of aerobic exercise, or less than thirty or less than say thirty to sixty minute of high intensity interval training was found uh, uh, to be the effective was found to be effective for visceral adipocyte tissue reduction. So the visceral adipocyte. Uh, uh, Tissue reduction may be you know, because of the uh, different factor uh, uh, which are associated with the high intensity, relatively high intensity exercise. Like for example, uh, 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 the HIIT, uh, you know, after the HIIT, different counter regulatory hormones, it may be uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine, you know, uh, these are uh, uh, raised even after the exercise, even after the exercise. So this, uh, because of this different hormonal effect, it may be uh, high, high in temperature, it may be high in what you call the uh, epoch, what you call the excess uh, post uh, uh, exercise oxygen consumption, or it may be effect, uh, it may be more effect on the RMR, that is resting metabolic rate, apart from the hormonal effect uh, as compared to the traditional exercise. So, so these are the uh, different possible effect uh, for uh, uh, the 
uh, underlying physiological mechanism for mediating the effect of the uh, <clears throat> beneficial effect uh, of HIIT. So going again uh, to the, uh, the, the combination of HIIT with research training, we already have seen that HIIT is important not only for the uh, fat loss, but also for the preservation of muscle mass and resistant training is gold standard for uh, preservation of muscle mass. That, but but if you combine between them, it will be very, very effective uh, because fat loss will, will be there plus preservation of muscle mass will be there. But when to do? Right? This is one of the uh, recent paper which was published still in 2022. Here you can see that among the diabetic female of say, uh, you know, these are the diabetic female. These are the group with the diabetic female. And uh, here you, uh, you can see that uh, this is the eight week study of a 45 to 65 year old uh, diabetic female uh, where exercise uh, they basically uh, have done, have given uh, the, the resistant exercise with HIIT in the same day or different day, huh? on the same day or different day. And you can see that, uh, you know, the difference in the, you know, fat mass and a fat free mass, you can see that. If you see, uh, you know, uh, the difference of the, you know, same day versus the different day uh, exercise regimen, you can see that if you separate uh, the high intensity exercise and resistant training, they are performed on, uh, you know, same type of exercise, same calorie consumption, same the requirement, same calorie requirement, everything on different day, then you are able to achieve, you may be able to achieve, uh, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, fat loss as well as more gain in the, Fat free mass, huh? which are statistical significant, which we are statistical significant. Like, for example, you may have an additional 1.2 or 1.16, uh, you know, kg of uh, uh, fat, uh, fat, fat mass loss may be associated, or a gain of, say, 0 0.70, 0 0.75 uh, uh, kg of the fat free mass uh, may be uh, associated if you, uh, say, if you separate, uh, you know, high intensity exercise with resistant training. This is, this is important. Hmm. So, uh, if your aim is uh, on the uh, visceral adipocyte tissue, then high intensity in interval training. If your aim is on, uh, f uh, you know, fat loss, then uh, aerobic uh, excess as well as resistant training. But if you want to do more preservation of the muscle mass as well as more loss of the fat, then HIIT uh, uh, is important and it has to be combined with resistant training and preferably on a different uh, day. Uh, then this is important. So going ahead with the uh, uh, the resistant training and body composition, we have already focused that resistant training is the gold standard for uh, preservation of the lean muscle mass. Uh, no doubt about it. But resistant training has also important effect on the what you call a fat mass, as well as on the effect on the what you call uh, uh, the visceral adipocyte tissue. Mm, the visceral adipocyte tissue. So resistant training is also important not only for the preservation of the muscle mass, but also for a reduction in a fat mass. And most importantly, on a visceral adipocyte tissue also. Mm, earlier, we see that uh, 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 if you compare recent training with aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise was more beneficial if you see only the reduction of VAT, that, that is true, uh, uh, especially HIIT. So HIIT is, may, is, uh, may be more superior as compared to resistant training, but still resistant training has some effect on uh, VAT reduction of visceral adipocyte tissue. Yeah, you can see that uh, uh, as compared to the control, as, as compared to the non-exercising control, the calorie uh, restriction along with the resistant training, uh, uh, the effect size was, uh, you know, the loss of, say, 3.8% uh, of body fat, uh, whereas uh, uh, the loss of the minus, uh, uh, you know, 5.3 uh, uh, kg of the fat, uh, you know, loss uh, was reported hmm. if you combine resistant training with caloric restriction. But the one important thing, how much caloric restriction, because if you keep on doing caloric restriction, then you may not be able to preserve the lean muscle mass. That is also important. So, so your caloric restriction, ideally, which we have, uh, you know, given in different uh, classic recommendation is not more than say 500 to 1000, you know, calorie calo calo per day, hmm. calorie deficit. Uh, if you combine rest and training, then uh, not more than 500 kilocalorie per uh, per day of cal caloric uh, deficit. So, so, if you maintain that caloric deficit, and in the caloric deficit state also, if you do rest and exercise, then lean body, uh, lean uh, 
body mass preservation was there. Like for example, the, there was loss of lean body mass of say uh, 0.3 kg, but it was not statistically significant. That means the preservation of the lean body mass was there if you do resistant training we call caloric restriction plus plus loss of the you know body fat as well as the percentage where body fat was reported and this was more uh, you know if you compare uh, resistant training with aerobic exercise which was approximately the effect size of percentage body fat was loss of 2.3 percentage or fat mass of 1.4 kg or if you do only resistant training then the only resistant training uh, will result in loss of 1.6 uh, you know percent of uh, body fat or one kg of the uh, you know fat mass and and this resistant training will result in the what you call uh, 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 the uh, the increase in lean body mass of around 0.8 kg uh, this this these are all effect size that means Combination of combination exercise, aerobic exercise with resistant exercise is extremely important. But if you do calorie restriction, then don't forget to eat resistant training because resistant training will help to preservation of the lean, lean body mass. Because our aim is what? Preservation or increase in lean body mass, whereas decrease in fat mass. That's important. In another uh, study also uh, 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 about regarding the loss of the fat uh, and the fat mass and visceral adipocyte tissue, for uh, resistant training, for resistant training, you can see that the loss uh, of you know fat mass, uh, percentage body fat, uh, and fat mass as well as visceral adipocyte tissue was approximately similar to that we achieved by aerobic exercise. That means previously aerobic exercise was found to be more superior, but here in another meta-analysis they said that uh, at least the uh, aerobic exercise, uh, you know, resistant training is uh, the effect of resistant training at least similar to that we achieve uh, by using the aerobic exercise. That means there, is, there should not be no excuse of uh, why you are not adding the resistant uh, training. So resistant training or resistant exercise is extremely important uh, if you are aiming for uh, um, optimization of body composition uh, with uh, optimization of strength to weight ratio with increased lean body mass and decreased uh, fat free mass. Going ahead uh, uh, regarding the caloric restriction, which I have just focused here, you can see that this is the uh, paper which was reported in 2021. You can see that uh, the change in the lean muscle, muscle mass has inversely, uh, you know, uh, related with the energy deficit. That means if you do too much caloric restriction, if you do too much uh, energy de deficit, then what will happen? Your uh, lean muscle mass may drop, uh, which we don't want. Hmm. And and this uh, uh, up to say approximately 500 half beyond 500 it decreased like anything. Hmm. So that means if you want to do caloric restriction for uh, 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 for what you call uh, uh, body uh, what you, body composition improvement or for obesity, then it it may be beneficial if you add aerobic uh, resistant training and the caloric restriction uh, you know or the energy deficit. Uh, is equal to or less than you know 500 kilocalories per day, and this will uh, minimize the uh, what you call uh, the lean muscle mass loss. So, if you want to minimize the lean muscle mass loss on caloric deficit, what you have to do? Number one, don't uh, do too much of energy deficit, say up to say 500 kilocalories per day, hmm. or extreme say 1,000. Uh, 1,000 will be too too much extreme. So up to or less than 500 uh, kilocalorie kilo per day, and this has to be accompanied with resistant training. But one has to understand that in the same paper, the author has said that the resistant training in the energy deficit state does not impair the strain gain because strain the strain is not only the function of the muscle uh, lean muscle muscle mass, but is also the function of the neuromuscular uh, neural uh, neuronal system because strain is the function of the neuromuscular. Hmm. Neuromuscular system, so because of the neuronal activity, they may be maintained. The strain may be maintained, but if you do too much calorie restriction, then lean body mass will be lost. Hmm. So, so that should be our take-home message. Going ahead with the uh, 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 the importance, the the under the, the possible underlying me mechanism of uh, the resistant training and the, the body composition is the importance of the ability of the resistant training to maintain the fat free mass. And we already know that the fat free mass has a direct relationship with TE, that is total energy expenditure. The total energy expenditure will keep on increasing if you increase the fat free mass. And 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 we have already shown that the you know RMR you know. Uh, RMR is important for uh, overall uh, the energy expenditure of, of the overall uh, uh, the energy uh, deficit, hmm. overall fat loss. 
So that's why uh, if you increase the fat-free mass, then indirectly you will be helping in, in uh, increasing the energy expenditure. Another point which one has to understand is the concept of the EPO or oxygen death. Oxygen death is also known as EPO. EPO is basically the excess post uh, exercise oxygen consumption and this is the that that is just this is the start of exercise this is the stop of exercise this is the classic study state exercise this is the study state oxygen consumption this is the oxygen deficit and you can see that just after the exercise finish your body keep on increasing keep on taking uh, the oxygen which is more which is more than the baseline and and this is basically the epo so if you are able to Take more epoch. That means what you are you are you you, uh, you are indirectly you know burning more energy expenditure. You are increasing more energy expenditure. And and, and the strength training and RMR uh, has been reported to have relatively more epoch as compared to traditional aerobic exercise. This is so traditional aerobic exercise has more energy expenditure during the exercise mm, during the exercise. But this SIIT or strength training may have more epoch and more energy expenditure after the exercise this is important so after the exercise that the epoch uh, uh, the influence on the epoch and influence on the rmr resting metabolic rate uh, is very important uh, like for example here in this uh, uh, graph table you, you can see this is a resting uh, metabolic measurement after say 12 hour of post exercise and this is the vo2 vo2 and the vo2 uh, the unit ml per kg per minute or uh, this is the absolute one that is ml per minute these are basically telling you about the resting metabolic rate how much oxygen you are consuming during uh, your resting condition not during exercise this is the baseline this is the after rest and training and this is the steady state uh, exercise which is basically the traditional uh, long uh, lsd type of the aerobic exercise this uh, iit or high uh, or interval type of the you know exercise and this is basically 30 minute ee 30 minute e energy expenditure is the energy expenditure after the exercise which is basically the epoch and this is the rer hmm. rer basically tells you about the you know the type of the fuel uh, fuel you, you are using whether you are using car where whether you are using predominantly fat or so like for example if you are uh, if your rer is near or uh, approximately one or more than one then you are predominantly using more carbohydrate and if your uh, uh, RER is less than 0.8 or around 0.8 or, or less than you are predominantly using more fat. So this, these are the information which is given. So you can see that the aerobic exercise, this is the comparison with the baseline star is comparison of the baseline head. Uh, this head is uh, basically the comparison with the steady state exercise. You can see that rest and training, hmm, the RMR is significantly more high intensity, RMR significantly more, but, but, but study state exercise, the RMR that is inc was not increased significantly different from the baseline. Also, epoch you can see that epoch was more after the resident training. It was also more after this, uh, you know, what you call uh, the interval training. Uh, but it was not uh, statistically uh, significantly different uh, in case of the SS as uh, you know, uh, study state exercise. Similarly, this is for the 12 hour post exercise uh, data and this is for the 24, 21 hour post exercise data. You can see that only, only resistant training, hmm, uh, not even IIT, that is high intensity, only resistant training was having more RMR as compared to the baseline. As compared to the baseline, they are uh, taking more uh, VO2, that is the uh, oxygen consumption was more as compared to the baseline, only in the rest, only after the resistant training, not after the SSS or there is to be state or interval training. But interval training, uh, the amount of oxygen consumption was still more uh, significantly more as compared to after doing the traditional aerobic exercise the study state. So this is important. Uh, for EPOC also same thing, EPOC was also significant only for uh, resistant training. And hence resistant training has more important uh, if your target is more focusing on EPOC, that is oxygen death or uh, what you call the post excess post uh, exercise oxygen consumption or RMR there is resting metabolic rate hmm. if you are focusing on that then you have to add rest and training there is no other way rest and training rest and training rest and training followed by HIIT or high inter interval uh, you know intensity interval training so th this one has to understand another important interesting uh, you know uh, data one has to know is uh, this is the, the this is the graph uh, shown for the person. Uh, there are lots of person who, who have lost more than 10 kg of the 
uh, weight loss was there. And, and normally, what is happening is if you do, uh, you know, if you do uh, uh, too much caloric restriction, the body has a compensatory mechanism. The resting metabolic rate may be slow down. Hmm. And because of that, more losing weight may be abnormal, may, may be problematic for you, difficult for you. So here you 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 can see that this is the what you call this is known as the adaptive thermogenesis or resting metabolic rate measured minus resting metabolic rate predicted. This is basically tells you about a metabolic slowdown, which uh, which generally happens after you know hypocaloric diet or so. Uh, you know after losing 10 uh, plus kg of the body weight. Here you you can see. But the but if you plot against the weight regain after one year, hmm, after the same subject after one year, then you can see that there is there was not significant, no pattern was there, huh? no correlation was there. Huh? You 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 cannot see any kind of the correlation. That means that means the meta the change in RMR, hmm, the change in the metabolic rate because of the different uh, intervention was not associated with the weight gain after after one year or so. That is long term weight gain has no correlation with changes in metabolic rate huh? and long term weight gain is more important for what physical activity your overall physical activity not only exercise huh? no no there are uh, there are lots of any uh, at also like for example non exercise activity thermogenesis these are important like maybe gardening maybe walking here and there uh, or simply uh, you know uh, what you call uh, doing kitchen stuff doing household activity these are all non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So your overall non-exercise th th thermogenesis activity as well as physical activity was more important uh, for predictor for weight regain after weight loss, not your difference in RMR. This is this also one has to. Hmm. So <clears throat> going again to the uh, 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 important topic, uh, important concept about a low load training. Before going to low load training, one has to understand that the, what maybe the mechanism what may be the underlying uh, uh, the, the principal and underlying mechanism for muscle hypertrophy three main three main mechanism is there the three main mechanism is there the first one is the mechanical tension which is most important then muscle damage may be there and metabolic stress these are the three main mechanism for hypertrophic uh, for stimulus for muscle hypertrophy this has to be done under physiological condition and but suppose if if your client or if your patient or if you are if you are having musculoskeletal injury or if you are having joint abnormality uh, if you are having if you are a very old age or this any kind of disease condition where uh, you are not able to do a high uh, load exercise high intensity resistant training uh, but you want to maintain the muscle mass mm, no. Then how what you can do then you can you have to focus on metabolic stress so by decreasing the mechanical tension Hmm. By decreasing the relative the muscle damage because of the mechanical tension, uh, hypertrophy can only be achieved if you increase the metabolic stress. How can this be done? So this is the importance for BFR or blood flow restriction training. Uh, or this is the important concept for BFR or blood flow restriction training. Here you can see that just by applying a cuff. Huh, proximal to the limb hmm, to the limb it may be uh, you know uh, upper limb or lower limb proximal to the limb we can see that uh, we, we can see that we 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 restrict the venous outflow huh? we don't restrict the arterial uh, this thing complete arterial occlusion is not there uh, we we don't occlude the artery complete occlusion never there but we restrict the venous outflow if you do like that then then what will happen then there will be the build up of the metabolite and this build up the metabolite will cause us metabolic stress more metabolic stress will be there even if you are not having mechanical tension more mechanical tension or muscle damage because of the you know physiological micro tear because of the uh, what you call uh, mechanical tension but metabolic stress will be very very high and this metabolic stress may be because of the different it may be because of the hydrogen and amp it may be because of the lactate it may be because of the nitric oxide it may be because of the potassium it may be because of the various other factor and this all uh, uh, you, you know uh, or uh, we will co will will cause uh, the relative hypoxia condition uh, to the muscle uh, which may which may lead to the you know uh, 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 more uh, uh, heat shock protein or which may activate the mTOR pathway which is important for the muscle uh, build up or which may the which may inhibit myostatin uh, and myostatin is uh, we already know that they are associated with the muscle atrophy mm, muscle atrophy or uh, they inhibit the muscle growth so all these things may happen and also 
and and because of the certain nerve nerve effect like type 3 and type 4 efferent uh, you know metabotropic reflex pathway they go and activate the pituitary gland and this pituitary gland uh, and there, there and there will be increased production of growth hormone and this growth hormone there will be even 290 times uh, more uh, you know times the baseline uh, production of the growth hormone may be there hmm. and this growth hormone is also because of the, the different metabolite and this growth growth hormone uh, uh, you know, will act on not only on the muscle where occlusion is there, huh? the, the muscle which is distal to the occlusion, but also the muscle which is to the proximal of occlusion and all other part of the muscle because the growth hormone, uh, the IGF, that is insulin like growth factor one, uh, they will be distributed in the blood uh, circulation. So, overall, uh, uh, the, the effect will be there. Mm. And because of this overall metabolic tension, not only, uh, uh, not only to the the muscle uh, where you apply the top, but also overall. So what will happen to muscle strength and hypertrophy, maintenance or build up may be possible. Hmm. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and the muscle growth may be because of the different, like I have uh, already told you, it may be satellite cell proliferation, nitric oxide, you know, IGF-1, and growth hormone is more important. We already know that for the, you know, build up of the connective tissue, connective tissue. So muscle connective tissue uh, build up uh, is extremely important. Just, so just by applying a cuff, hmm, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in the limb, you can do a low load resistant exercise, uh, or you can do isometric hold also, hmm, in different resistant exercise uh, in order to achieve more metabolic stress uh, in less uh, mechanical tension. Ultimately, lead to the you know uh, getting the same benefit. Uh, you uh, in case of the you know muscle mass preservation or muscle even for muscle strength also. But one has to understand that muscle strength. Still, we will require the old traditional resistant training because the muscle thing, the you know, the intensity uh, is the is is more of the predominant for muscle strength. But hypertrophy or muscle mass, uh, you know, low load uh, resistant training like BFR blood flow resistant training is important. But for strength training, you have to focus on uh, your traditional uh, resistant training also with high intensity. Hmm. So uh, these are the you know different uh, you know meta analysis has published uh, showing the effectiveness of the blood flow uh, resistance training. Like for example, muscle mass gain uh, was there, even muscle strength uh, you know maintenance or gain was there for uh, using the blood flow resistance training. And blood flow resistance training can also be applied for aerobic exercise also. Uh, and not only for resistance, but also aerobic. Some uh, some study, many study has done uh, with blood flow resistance, passive blood flow resistance, or uh, blood flow re re resistance training at the baseline, uh, or uh, without any kind of the exercise intervention. Also, hmm, still preservation of muscle mass was reported. So all these things uh, is important. So just by understanding the few physiological mechanism and manipulating accordingly, you can achieve. Uh, you know uh, the. Uh, uh, the muscle mass hypertrophy or muscle mass gain, or at least preservation of the muscle mass uh, without uh, having high uh, load. Like for example, basically we have given uh, the intensity of 20 to 30 percent of one RM. Hmm, 20 to 30 percent of the one RM is basically that uh, general general load given in the BFR training. But, or, or you know, and this load is generally done for repetition of higher repetition, more than 15 uh, reps, huh? because they are low load, so uh, repetition may be higher. And with the rest intervention, uh, interval of uh, maybe 30 to 60 or less than one minute rest interval may be here. And for occlusion, how much pressure you have to apply? Hmm? How much pressure you have to apply is important. You have to calculate based upon your uh, total arterial occlusion pressure. Like, for example, if you want to use upper limb, then it may be approximately around, say, 40 to 50 percent or 50 50 percent of the AOP. Hmm? Or for lower limb, it may be around, say, 80 percent of the AOP. Hmm? So by using uh, these different concepts, uh, you know, uh, we can still maintain, uh, you know, our uh, uh, lean body mass uh, in case of the elderly population or in case of the, say, uh, different, uh, the person who are not able to do high intensity, uh, high load traditional rest and training. So that is the important. So after understanding all the, the 
basic uh, concept, basic physiology, uh, you have to apply that knowledge because see, knowledge is uh, it's not important. What is important is application of knowledge is extremely important. Intervention has to be there. Interventional physiology has to be there and interventional physiology is basically the exercise prescription. Exercise can be prescribed based upon different principles like for some sport, uh, it may be exercise has to be specific uh, because specific uh, demand will be there to the impose uh, adaptation to the imposed demand. Huh? Specific adaptation will be due to the imposed demand. It may be exercise has to be progressively overload. The principle of the progressive overload it has to be reversibility. That means you have to uh, uh, you don't do that type of exercise. Then de training may be there. Hmm. So reversibility may be there. If you don't do enough uh, sufficient load and whatever you can maybe lose uh, uh, that that is known as the de training effect, or or it may be you have to vary depending upon uh, the different. Uh, you know, the component of the exercise as well as different, uh, uh, you know, uh, the duration or type of the exercise which is basically the variation or periodization so that monotonicity as well as overuse uh, uh, injury or overuse problem uh, is not there, as well as you have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, design your exercise based upon individuality. Everyone is different hmm, based upon individuality has to be there. And exercise prescription of different exercise uh, uh, modality like aerobic resistance, flexibility, balance can be done based upon on fit i uh, fit the bp that is fi fitt bp principle that is frequency intensity type frequency of exercise intensity of exercise duration of exercise type of the exercise volume of exercise and progression or pattern of the exercise volume is basically the combination of three that one two three that is frequency intensity duration uh, they compose of volume hmm. so in this way different exercise intervention can be given it may be balance you know coordination flexibility resistance training aerobic training you have to give depending upon your requirement like for example for uh, this is just an example for exercise prescription typical exercise prescription for overweight and obese individual like aerobic exercise you can give uh, uh, in the frequency of the say equal to more than five days per week rest in training to two to three days per week and flexibility also equal to more than two to three days per week and the intensity maybe around say uh, 50 to 59 percent or up to say equal to more than 60 percent of the vo 2 r that is the vo 2 reserve or hrr that is heart rate reserve the rest and training intensity may be say 60 to 70 percent of the one rm and it may be increased gradually based upon a progressive overload principle or flexibility can be given up to say tightness or slightly discomfort not up to the level of pain hmm. and uh, you know the time duration duration may be say 30 minutes per day or 150 minutes per week uh, it can be increased up to say 200 to 300 minute, uh, minute per week or say equal to more than 60 minutes per uh, day for rest and training, you can give say up to say two to four set of I to uh, twelve repetition. I to twelve repetition of two to four set can be done uh, uh, com comprising of major muscle group. Uh, major muscle group there is equal to more than six muscle groups are there. Uh, you can do and for flexibility, you can do uh, the static hold. Uh, you know, hold st stretching can be done say approximately up to ten to thirty second. You can do repetition two to four uh, times. Repetition can be done. Different type of aerobic exercise, walking, cycling, swimming, or if you want, then high intensity interval training can also be incorporated. Uh, say uh, twice a week or once a week depending upon your recovery status and your, your baseline fitness activity and rest and training may be free uh, type of the type may be free weight uh, you know uh, free weight rest and body weight uh, it may be calisthenic it may be uh, rest and machine based or flexibility can be pnr stretching or it may be dynamic uh, or it may it may be st 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 static pressing not only exercise but you also focus on increase the spontaneous physical activity like non exercise physical activity leisure time physical activity level you you also focus on increase on that uh, 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 the overall because uh, we have already seen that the overall uh, you know after the weight loss the weight regain long term weight re regain it depends upon overall physical activity it not only include uh, exercise but also also, non-exercise uh, physical activity and also breaking of sedentary activity is very important. Sedentary physiology is different from exercise physiology, and then sedentary has a in the, has a independent negative effect apart from exercise. Lack of exercise, lack of exercise is not sedentary. Hmm. So exercise and sedentary activity has an independent effect of each other. Therefore, if you increase the exercise, then you have to decrease the sedentary activity. Sedentary breaking uh, time may be uh, there for, for every say 20 to 30 minutes. Hmm. So based upon a different, uh, you know, the concept uh, uh, of uh, uh, exercise intervention or different or physical activity snacking or 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 incorporation of some of the spiritual activity, uh, you know, the overall mind body uh, activity, yoga and all that stuff. 
uh, 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 we can design our exercise uh, uh, training or our exercise activity in such a way that uh, we may uh, be able to achieve different uh, component of the body composition or physical fitness uh, component. Like for example, here in this paper, uh, we have uh, basically done a six week of sprint uh, you know, strength and agility training, hmm. effect of agility training on uh, elite player. Huh? These are the male uh, national player, male hockey field hockey player. They are already elite. That means not much uh, improvement is not there. If you see the comparison of the, you know, trained person and untrained person, every scope of improvement is there in case of the untrained person. The trained person is very difficult to increase. So only and only, uh, only six weeks, hmm, six weeks of uh, uh, this training, we were able to achieve. Uh, you know, significant uh, statistical significant reduction is, uh, in, in body fat as well as the improvement in lean body mass. Although BMI and body weight was not there, and change in the body weight at BMIC. This is what we we require in case of the player. We require what in order to optimize you know strength to weight ratio. Strength has to be increased, weight has to be relatively less. If you are able to produce more strength at the relatively less weight. This is very nice. So then, and strength is directly uh, caused by what? Muscle, uh, neuromuscular system. So muscle mass is also very important. So if you are able to maintain muscle mass at no further increase in body weight, then you are beneficial. This is what we have achieved. We are not able, uh, we don't increase the body weight, body weight. That after six weeks, body weight was not statistically significant. BMI was also remains the same, but improvement in body composition was there that is reduction is statistical significant reduction is uh, percentage body fat and statistical significant improvement in the lean body mass was there so so all this uh, thing is important and uh, and based upon all the the physiological uh, principle you have to design your exercise intervention and you can even do uh, you know balance exercise flexibility exercise you know coordination exercise even at your workplace also hmm, work workplace also by by breaking your uh, your your activity and doing exercise snacking hmm, exercise you know a small small exercise distributed throughout the day uh, you can do and recently one paper has also come up uh, you know that you know flamingo uh, like standing that is single leg standing uh, was uh, uh, found to be a uh, what you call a significant uh, 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 predictor for increasing mortality hmm. That means muscle mass and muscle strength is absolutely important uh, as you as this is it. This one has to understand. So this comes to uh, uh, come to the conclusion of my slide. And and my message is always physical activity, exercise and positive lifestyle has to be done uh, so that we achieve the positive physiological adaptation and this physical, positive physiological adaptation will lead to the performance, fitness and health. And our aim should not be to the uh, BMI or body weight, but our aim should be focused on body composition. Don't focus on body weight, uh, change in body weight. Hmm change in body weight, but focus on change in body composition, optimization of body composition. Like for example, here you can see that this is the quadriceps of say a 70 year old sedentary person. Hmm. Sedentary person. Hmm. And this is the uh, this is the quadriceps of the 70 year old triathlete. See, you can see the amount of the muscle mass. This is very important. And, re and same here, you can see that they are both of uh, what you call the 70 years of age. And she is the one of the finest, all these competitive female bodybuilders. We need to go for record. Ernestine, so far, and and they are both of the same age. So you, you just add on exercise intervention, especially strength training, especially strength training, and focus on maintenance, preservation, and promotion of your lean body mass and reduction of your unhealthy body fat, especially visceral adipocyte tissue. Thank you very much.